one hand. Check. If you brought your Bibles, I don't have the wrong turn the lights on. Because I want to be able to see you. You can see me, but I want to be able to see you. So that uh, you won't be sleeping. Matthew chapter 27. If you got your Bibles and uh, we'll turn the lights on, you can follow along if you want. Uh, the other night, Friday night, we had a Good Friday service. I mentioned earlier. And uh, we talked about the seven saints, Christ from the cross. And uh, we started off and we skipped the first one. And we went down the line and we said, we're going to skip that. We're going to omit that for right now. And we'll come back to that Sunday. And I went through the list. And, and uh, the first one we mentioned was actually the second one, the other from the cross. But it's what Jesus said to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. And then he said to his mother, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. And then as he hung there in the darkness on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he said, I thirst. And then he, he said in a loud voice, it is finished. And then he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And so we talked about that, but that those statements, we learned a lot of things on the cross. And at the cross we find when he says, today you'll be with me in paradise, we find salvation at the cross. And when he says, woman, behold your son, we find love. At the cross. And when he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We find atonement at the cross. Then when he says, I thirst, we find his suffering in our place at the cross. When he said it is finished, we find victory at the cross. And then when he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, we find security. In Jesus' ministry, now guys, I, I many of you who know me, if you're a first time visitor, and you may not know this, but I'll just come right out and say it. I'm a big baby. All right? I'm one of these guys. Thank you. Thank you. So if I get a little emotional today, uh, that's why. But uh, usually, you know, Easter especially, I guess in my mind I think about where I was before Christ. And I think about His sacrifice. And it overwhelms me. And uh, so today... I apologize ahead of time. I'm glad the kids came out here to sing because as Virgil was playing, I'm thinking over my message today and I'm, I'm just overwhelmed with emotion and I'm so glad they came because I may have been bawling when I came out. So, But Jesus' ministry starts with prayer. When he's being baptized, he comes up, he's praying, and it ends with prayer. This scene that we see at the cross. And it's the first saying that he says. Do you know what it is? Do you know what, which one we left out? The very first. Forgive them. They don't know what they do. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. It wasn't meant for anybody else's ears other than the Father. And the first thing he says is, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. All of the other things that we looked at the other night, and we mentioned this morning, were meant for specific ears, except for one. When he said, it is finished, it was meant for everyone to hear. It was a cry of victory. But when he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, it wasn't for anybody else to hear. See, if we were standing on a hillside or, or away from where Jesus was, and we saw him being hung on the cross, we might see his lips move. And we might be curious as to what is he saying? He's saying something. His, his lips are moving, but what is he saying? And we, as we get closer, we see, yeah, he's saying something. And we'd have to get right up to him to hear because it, it wasn't for anybody else. It was a prayer to the Father. He says, Father, forgive me. Now, the years I've been in ministry and been studying and things like that, I learned something new all the time that as studying this, I, I, I found out that this forgive them is an imperfect imperative. Pretty impressive, right? I'm like, what is that? Well, I, I learned that this prayer that he prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, is an imperfect imperative that simply means this. It was a command that Jesus was giving to the Father, and he did it over and over and 
over. It wasn't just uttered one time. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, it was something that he uttered over and over and over and over. Look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse 33. And when they had come to the place called Golgotha, they, that is to say, place of the skull, they, the soldiers, gave him sour wine made with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and my clothing they cast lots. And for my clothing they cast lots. So as they hung him up on the cross, the first thing he says is a prayer. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. As they divided his garments, he was saying, Father, forgive them. Let's read on. Verse 38. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by, they blasphemed, wagging their heads, it says, and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Continually, over and over. He uttered this phrase over and over. Then verse 41, likewise the chief priests also mocking with their scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he, was, if he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Verse 43, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him and if he will, have him. He said, I am the Son of God. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In verse 44, even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same things. They were saying the same things. The two thieves that hung on either side of them were saying the same things. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. An imperfect imperative. We don't really care about that. All we need to know is over and over and over. That overwhelms me. In Luke chapter 23, we see, we see the, the rulers and the soldiers and both the criminals, all three of them, saying, if he's the Messiah, tell him to come off the cross. If he's really, truly the Son of God, tell him to come down. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Just those passing by. What is he fulfilling here? Remember what Peter said? Jesus how often do we forgive your enemies? Those who wrongfully do, do things to you, how often do we do that? Seven times? See, Peter thought he was doing something big, didn't he? See, in the time, three times the scribes said, forgive somebody three times after that, wash your hands up. So when Peter said seven times, Jesus, he thought he was really doing something big. And Jesus said, no, not seven times, but what? Seventy times seven. Over and over and over and over. So what we see on the cross, we've been doing a series and we're wrapping it up today. You didn't know it. Dream killers. One of the biggest dream killers is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. The scripture teaches that Jesus is our intercessor means he is praying for us. You see, on the cross he said, Father, forgive them over and over and over. And that still, that imperfect imperative means that he continues to pray that today. Let that be true. Father, forgive them. I don't know about you, but that, that this strikes me. Father, every time I do something stupid, and I believe it, ask Shanda, I can do some stupid things. But when I sin against him, he says, Father, forgive him. He wins that money. Now, it's not a free pass. 
Well, he's saying, I'm going to forgive him everything. No, see, you, you, in order to restore fellowship, you have to repent. And he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, right? But we must come to the cross and repent. Turn over to Matthew chapter 28. It's over the page there. Matthew 28, verse 1. Aren't you glad that two, over 2,000 years ago that it didn't end right here? <coughs> I guess not. Aren't you glad it didn't end right here? Yeah. All right, see? You've got the lights on and you're still sleeping. <laughs> Aren't you glad it didn't end with this tomb still over or the, the stone still over the tomb? Yeah. Aren't you glad that it, you know, that the stone was rolled away not so Jesus could get out. But so we can see him. Right? So we know it was empty. And so it didn't end there. Let's look at chapter 20, verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like night lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples. Now, many of you will remember, if you've been to Walton Street, we talked about Jesus when he calls his disciples. He says to them, what? Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Follow me. Come and see. And I've told you that anytime you want to, you know, invite somebody to church or you want to invite somebody to, you know, try Jesus, just say, come and see. And it strikes me here that in verse 6, the angel says, He is not here, for He is risen. As He said, come and see. Come and see where He lay. It's empty. I am so glad that over a year ago, we got to go with the three guys, uh, three other guys to, to Israel. We got to stand where the tomb was empty. We got to walk right there where the tomb was empty. We got to see it with our own eyes. Not just the picture, but we got to walk right there. It's empty, guys. I went over there to check it out for you, all right? <laughs> we went over there, we, we scoped it out. It is empty. But he says, come and see. And I want to invite you right now, if you've never experienced the forgiveness of God, you, I just, you can't describe it. Words cannot describe it. Come and see. Come and see. Like Floyd prayed, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, we're changed. My life has changed. On a, you know, on a dorm step degree of college, rededicated my life to God and said, okay, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to, I'm going to do that in my room, doing algebra. I answered a call that God called me back when I was nine years old. And he changed me. And I ran from God for so many years. If those are going to do the testimonies, if you guys will go ahead and go on over. There's probably people in here who lived a lot wilder life than I, but there's probably some people who have not lived a life that have been through some things that I've been through. We're not going to have a contest here, because... But I do want to say this, that, you know, I can only imagine, I've had an opportunity to see some of my classmates that I graduated with, when they find out, been able to see their face, when they find out what I do for a living, they say, you're a what? Pastor? No way. See, all they know is the, the old one. They haven't seen the changes. I've been forgiven. Now, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But I'm changed. Why? Because of unforgiveness. Can you imagine 
if, the, if he never uttered that first word from the cross, the other, the other six things would not matter at all. No. Father, forgive me. See, unforgiveness is a dream killer. God had this, God had this dream, this plan, back from in the garden after Adam and Eve sinned. He told the serpent, Satan, he said, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your what? Your head. He had this plan all the way back in the garden, and now all of a sudden it's coming. Do you know what Jesus did when he hung on that cross and died and bore the sins of the world? And when he came out of that tomb three days later, do you know what he did? Crushed him. He bruised him for just a little bit, but when he came out of the tomb, he crushed him. So you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And because of that, you and I can face tomorrow. Because of that, we have forgiveness. Because of that, we, we have salvation and freedom and victory over death. Without forgiveness, there is no dream. Now, we all face difficulties, and we all need forgiveness. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fall short of God's standard. And we've been forgiven for a lot. And God has blessed us for a lot. Some of us, sometimes we face difficulties. Some of you, I know for certain, are facing some difficult situations right now as I stand here and stand. And you think nobody else has ever gone through that. Scripture makes it pretty clear that he's faced everything that we face. Every difficulty that we face. And you know what? There's somebody else out there who's facing what you face or has faced that. And they've come through. And I just want to encourage you today to know that whatever you're facing, God offers forgiveness. God offers power for the journey. What you're about to see is some of you have seen this before, some of you haven't. There's new people, there's same people, but people that face diversity. And what you're going to see is on one side, you're going to see what they maybe struggled with, the other side where they've ended up. And I want you to see there's hope beyond that. There's hope beyond that. And Jesus, in the scripture says that he endured because of the joy that was set before him. It wasn't the cross, but it was that. I said, I said, uh, when I was nine, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but when I was nine years old, uh, went to a revival with my grandmother. Age of purchase before, so we had it. I'm going to share just a little bit. You have to understand my grandmother, which I wish you could be here to see. I was raised in an assembly of God Pentecostal Church. And I uh, went to a revival with my grandmother one night. I was nine. And we went through the prayer line. I call it the prayer line. At the end of the service, most everybody would get up and they'd all go line up to go past the altar to let the, the pastor or the evangelist or whatever pray for you if you had a need or whatever. And my grandma would always go up, be interceding for somebody. She'd always be praying for somebody. Not herself, but always somebody else. So I didn't want to sit there by myself, not knowing anybody, so I just would tag along with grandma and grab a hold of her skirt. And we'd go down. I wasn't going down for prayer. I was just tagging along. We went to this revival. I'd never been to this church before. Never met the pastor, the evangelist. And we walked through. And he prayed for my grandma. And he looked at me. And I'm like, give him the I'm all right sign. Believe me. <laughs> and he stops me. And he grabs me. And he says, son, one day you're going to be a preacher. I looked at him. I thought, you're nuts. <laughs> and that ain't going to happen. That is not going to happen. He said, you've been asking a lot of questions, and uh, one day you're going to be free. So I dismissed it like he was some crazy lunatic, and went on my way. The next week, next weekend, we went to a different church, other side of town, different evangelists. Comes time for the prayer line, tag along. Gets to the front, prays for Grandma, looks at me, and I'm like, all right. 
And he stops me and says, son, one day you're going to be a preacher. One day. I thought, well, maybe that's trying to tell me something. So for years, I ran from that. My testimony part of it would be this. Twelve years running for my father. Been through some rough times. But the end is I'm going to trade it further. It's been a long road from this to this. Even 12 years. It's a long road. But because of this, it's
just show up at Long Street Christian Church on Long Street. We'd love to have you come back and, and be our guests and to be a part of, of what God is doing. And I uh, appreciate you coming today. And uh, just thank you for being a part of this day to be able to celebrate the whole great relationship. Everybody hit with us and let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for the victory that we have in you and the power. And Lord, I thank you so much for the people not just standing on this stage, but who are out here in the, the congregation, Lord, who, who can say truly today, I have been changed because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you for that. And as we leave here today, let's continue to celebrate every day, every day, the resurrection. We just thank you, Lord, and pray you in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Six o'clock, if you can come back and help us tear down, that'd be awesome.